So you want to know about Titans. We did a fun series of shorts a little while back where we went over each of the different types of Titan as well as that of the fabled Castigator and I just really had a lot of fun making it. So I thought it would be a good idea to use and expand upon some of that knowledge by creating a full video on each of the different Titan classes and as you might expect I think the best way to do it would be in size order starting with the smallest and ending with the largest. So let's begin with that of the lesser known Rapier Scout Titans. Now I couldn't actually locate any visual depictions of the Rapier class so we're going to have to use our imagination with what little written descriptions we actually have. The Rapier Scout class is described simply as being smaller than the Warhound Titan in both physical stature and equipped armaments. It's really difficult to imagine a class of Titan that's smaller than the Warhound because there is actually a class of Knight that almost matches the Warhound in size. That of the Acastus Knight Porphyrian and Asterius. So I suppose in a way it's very interesting to imagine a titan that truly acts as a bridge between the titan legios and the knight households. A curiosity that whilst doesn't explain why there's no depictions of the rapier titan but certainly helps explain it at least a little bit is that it's noted by the latter days of the Horus Heresy the rapier classes were almost all completely gone whereas most of the other imperial technologies lost to time took a few hundred or even a thousand years to finally disappear. So the rapier had pretty much bounced before the emperor was gorilla glued to the golden throne. Right, moving on to a titan that we do in fact have visual depictions of, that of the Warhound Scout Titan. Now, despite being the smallest titan still running around in the 41st millennium, the Warhound Scout is one of my favourites. Being the only titan that's actually anthropomorphic in nature, with its reverse leg joints and wolf-like head, which is only even more wolf-like when you go back to look at the even older iterations of the Grim Darkness of the Far Future, we're talking 1st and 2nd edition. The original depictions of the head of this god engine all genuinely look like very angry caricatures of dogs. You know, when I made the shorts on the titans like a month or two ago, I kind of got into the rhythm of reading out their armaments like some sort of excited used car salesman. So, uh... <clears throat> For the armaments of the Warhound Titan, you can equip on each shoulder-mounted weapon arm Inferno Cannons, Plasma Blast Guns, Turbo Laser Destructors, Vulcan Mega Bolters, Conversion Beam Desolators, Volkai Eradicators, Graviton Destructors, the terrifying Ursus Claw or Natrix Shock Lance, both born of the traitorous Legio Ordax with two hole-mounted Void Shield Generators. And like with some of the other titans, the Warhound has a few subclasses of titans, such as the Wolf class, which like most of the others is pretty much identical to the Warhound, but uses a different modus operandi in which they're equipped with weapons specialised in taking down ground units built to destroy larger titans. And as an extra unique feature, the Wolf class almost exclusively runs in packs of two to achieve this end. Then we have the Mastiff class Warhound, which again is almost visually indistinguishable from the standard Warhound, but actually has slightly less armor plating, giving the Mastiff a greater top speed. These Titans typically operate as flanking vanguard for larger Titans, charging in and destroying targets and then retreating very quickly. And we also have the Jackal class Titan, again another Warhound that in appearance is very much the same as the Warhound standard, but actually has a different role in combat to the others. Primarily used for ambush assaults on infantry and light vehicles, the Jackal is typically equipped with Vulcan Mega Belters and or Inferno Guns, in addition to jacked up Void Shields, making them ideal for hit and run battles. And of course, we can't talk about the Warhound variants without talking about the Direwolf class Titan, also known as the Heavy Scout Titan. I can already hear some of you TF2 players screaming right now. Probably the most visually distinctive relative of the Warhound, the Direwolf abandons the shoulder-mounted weapons for torso pintle-mounted Mega Bolters, and receives a noticeably larger amount of armor plating, visually following a similar design philosophy to that of the Acastus Knight Porphyrian. Though while this extra plating does, as you expect, make the Direwolf slower and less agile than its counterparts, it's still quicker than any larger Titan frame, and comes equipped with its own massive carapace-mounted neutron laser or volcano cannon, making it the only Warhound adjacent Titan that could consistently finish off one of its more massive brethren. So with the Warhound and its variants out of the way, we need to move on to the Reaver Battle Class Titan, the smallest of the Battle Class Titans. For reasons I struggle to explain, the Reaver is my favourite Titan. There's just something so rudimentary about the Reaver that I really gel with. And I'm not sure if it's the fact that in comparison to the other Titans, it remains one of the most in line with its old Hammer depictions, or if it's the fact that the face reminds me of Stewie Griffin. But in any event, I do really love this Titan, and I own six of them for Legiones Imperialis coming out soon. In any event, the Reaver is kind of the middle brother of the Titans, but unlike most middle brothers, it actually receives a lot of love, especially lore-wise. The Reaver is credited as being one of the oldest Titans in terms of its origins, predating that of even the Warlord class. And maybe we could take a leap of logic and look at the way its archaic frame has a degree of simplicity to it and assume that maybe that could be a factor. You know, this idea that it's a very simple yet effective beast. Anyways, <clears throat> 
On your Reaver Battle Class Titan, you can bring to bear Gatling Blasters, Laser Blasters, Volcano Cannons, Melter Cannons, Titan Power Fist, Titan Chain Fist, Titan Siege Hammers, Titan Power Rams, Titan Power Swords, and Titan Wrecker Flails. And for its carapace, you can mount the intense Apocalypse Missile Launcher, Plasma Blast Gun, Turbo Laser Destructor, Inferno Gun, Conversion Beam Distillator, Volkite Eradicator, and Graviton Destructor. And for defense, this holy machine houses four immense Void Shields. Blah. I'm sticking to the gag. <clears throat> I suppose another reason why the Reaper is my favourite is its all-round versatility. It may not have the speed of the Warhound or the firepower of the Warlord, but it makes up for it by being efficient in almost all kinds of engagement. And with such a range of weapon options, it's ready to bring excessive festivities to pretty much any party. Now, moving on, there's a bunch of different niche Titan classes that don't have any models or depictions, so we're going to try to speed through them here. First up, we've got the Punisher class Titan that moved around with three legs and wielded two Teslan Accelerator Destructors and Plasma Annihilators under each barrel. And again, sadly, there's no depiction of this absolutely wild Titan, but we know that it made at least one appearance in the War of the Beasts in M32. And the Carnivore class Titan, which stood somewhere between the Reaver and the Warlord in size, of which fought in the Titan Death Campaign on Beta Garmin during the Horus Heresy. Also, fun fact for anyone unaware or uninitiated, if you're getting into Imperial Titans, you do well to do some reading on Titan Death or Beta Garmin. There's a whole Adeptus Titanicus book on it, but the short of it is that it was the biggest ever known face-off of Titans during the Horus Heresy, where hundreds of god engines did battle all at once. Anyways, moving on, we have the Mirage class Battle Titans, which was said to be scaled in between the Carnivore and the Warlord class that saw battle during the Heresy and the Great Crusade, as well as the Komodo, Apocalypse, and Ex executor class titans that we know pretty much nothing about but were present during the Heresy, Great Crusade, and War of the Beast. Anyways, moving on to the Warbringer Nemesis class titan, to make things really simple, the Warbringer Nemesis is kind of a super size me direwolf titan. Same concept, but turned up to 11. Standing somewhere between the Reaver and the Warlord in size, the Warbringer Nemesis is in some ways the Sniper class Titan, with the same arm-mounted weapon options that you can find on the Reaver, but carrying a colossal Quake Cannon or the monumental Bellicosa Volcano Cannon on its carapace. The Warbringer houses an obscene amount of topside armor as well as anti-air defense batteries, making it a nightmare to take down for air support or mortar forces. Though despite all this, my favourite thing about the Warbringer is their machine spirits, which have a seemingly preternatural ability to detect threats before their piloting princeps and moderati, often leading to Warbringers actually turning their weapons onto targets before they've even appeared. So imagine this, you're piloting your Titan, and without your command, the torso of your Titan begins to twist into the direction of a cliff edge, and seconds later, an enemy god engine appears from the other side of that cliff edge and neither you nor your crew had any knowledge of it, and that's the Warbringer Nemesis Titan machine spirits for you. Capable of neutralizing other Titans with a single shot, no Titan, no matter the size, will have an easy time facing off against the Nemesis, expecting to leave unscathed. Right, time for the big boy, most people's favorite Titan, and for bloody good reason, the daunting Warlord class Titan. You all know the Warlord Titan and its iconic Mars pattern design. You know, Stepping into the display rooms at Warhammer World and seeing these colossal things as part of the many dioramas is genuinely one of the best experiences I've ever had as someone who's into this hobby. I'd really recommend going to see them. Right, let's get its armaments out of the way, shall we? Ahem. Packing more weapons than almost any other variety of Titan, the Warlord class comes equipped with Sun Fury Plasma Annihilators, Mori Quake Cannons, Saturnine Last Cutters, Arioc Power Claws with built in Vulcan Mega Bolters, Macro Gatling Cannons, Laser Blasters, Plasma Destructors, Volkite Destructors, Graviton Ruinators, Extirpator Cannons, Titan Power Rams, Titan Power Swords, Titan Wrecker Flails, Harpoon Missile Launchers, Titan Harpoon Launchers. And for its immense carapace, this walking monstrosity can house double Apocalypse Missile Launchers, Double Barrel Turbo Laser Destructors, Plasma Blast Guns, Triple Barreled Reaver Laser Blasters. Blasters, Reaver Melter Cannons, Reaver Gatling Blasters, Vortex Missile Banks, Multi-Laser Batteries, and for close defense, it wheels two Mauler Bolt Cannons, two Ardex Defense Laser Cannons, and for those of you who are prepared to pay an ungodly premium for your Mars Pattern Warlord class, we can swap out the entire head for a fucking single giant Death Strike Cannon. <coughs> <coughs> yep, not doing that again. <coughs> no, seriously. Historically, there has been at least one instance of a Warlord Titan where its entire head was replaced with a Death Strike Cannon. Absolutely mad. For the majority of Titan Legions, the Warlord is the one that they have the most of. For its damage output and damage sustaining abilities, it's kind of the most efficient Titan to create. Although there is some lore contradiction there too, as during the Horus Heresy, Legio Zestobiax created a larger number of Reaver Titans citing the same reasoning. So. Who knows? In any event, the bottom line is when a Warlord Titan takes to the field as an ally, you'll walk in the footsteps of a literal god, Engine. 
And if you want to oppose this without your own titanic assistance, the likelihood of being immolated on an atomic level becomes astronomically high. And like the Warhound, the Warlord does have some subclasses, such as the Warlord Deathbringer, the most common form of Warlord because of its adaptability, regularly housing any of the aforementioned armaments, the Deathbringer is truly the Coca-Cola of Titans. There's also the Warlord Eclipse Titan, which is typically equipped with a very standard Warlord armament of one Volcano Cannon, one Gatling Blaster, and a pair of Apocalypse Missile Launchers. Never a bad choice of weapons, it's usually brought to bear in instances where a cadre of Reavers simply wouldn't be enough. We also have the Warlord Night Gaunt Titan 2, which is the Warlord of choice when you really need to punch someone in the face with a fist the size of a city apartment complex. As you can probably tell, the Night Gaunt is the close range Warlord variant, often with melee weapons ready in both the left and right hand. And last, but certainly not least, we have the Nemesis Warlord Titan, often referred to as the Titan Killer. Outfitted with extra hull plates and long range weapons such as quake cannons, volcano cannons and plasma destructors, as well as titan claws and titan fists for close encounters. And whilst the extra hull plating does make it generally slower, it doesn't do anything to slow down the speed of the shells it fires or the speed of the claw about to rend off an enemy titan's head. Did I say last but not least? Well, technically not last as we have one more warlord variant that no titan list of any kind would be complete without. And that's the Warlord Sinister Class Psy Titans of the Ordo Sinister. Rumor has it that the Emperor actually had a hand in the creation of these ungodly beasts. Imagine several Alpha Class Psychers were a titan, and that's in fact what these are. More literally than you might think, as within the holes of these Warlord Titans are any number of Alpha Class Psychers receiving uh, less than humane treatment round the clock, within very special containment units channeling their warp energy into the Titan, utilizing the most massive psychic powers that only the most powerful Chaos Sorcerers or Grey Knights could hope to contend with for even a moment in time. Also curiously enough, the commanding princeps of one of these Psychic Titans is always a blank slash psychic null, for the obvious reason is to make sure they remain unaffected by the Alpha Class Psychers in the trunk. Now this next bit is a bit of a theory that a few friends and I have chucked around, but we have reason to believe that there may be a likelihood of Sinister Class Princeps more often being women, due to the 9-13 incident slash Cataclysm of Pentacanes slash Daughters of the Crow. Of which, to make a long story very, very short, revolves around an imperial world that possessed a very female-centric society, with an outlandishly large number of these women being born as psychic blanks slash psychic nulls, who allegedly comprise a huge portion of the Emperor's psychic null bodyguards, the Sisters of Silence. And so it stands to reason that the one in a trillion individual who could not only withstand the machine spirit of a warlord in order to pilot one, but also be a one in a million blank at the same time may have had a higher likelihood of coming from this planet. Anyways, I've digressed. In terms of the kind of damage a Warlord Sinister can dish out, imagine a standard Warlord armament, which is already a powerhouse in its own right, and add a plethora of psychic abilities to it as well, ranging from shooting missiles into the warp, only to have them exit beyond an adversary's void shields, or using psychic power to basically repair damage sustained during combat, or hell, keeping it simple by summoning massive barrages of warp lightning onto foes. There's no escaping the fact that the Warlord Sinisters are the deadliest of all Warlord variants. Anyways, let's move on to the terrifying Warmaster Titan. Now, for the Warmaster, there's only two known variants, the Warmaster Annihilator and the Warmaster Iconoclast. The Warmaster looms over the Warlord, and despite being nowhere near as iconic, it matches and even outperforms the Warlord in both offensive and defensive capabilities. Although, it is fair to say that the Warlord as well as the Reaver Titan are both far more adaptable than the Warmaster due to the limited role its two archetypes have. The Warmaster Iconoclast has two primary melee weapons, the Desolator Chainsword, which is the biggest chainsword in the entire setting, and the Kriya Siege Drill, which outside of the massive mining machines crafted by the Adepts of Mars is without a doubt the largest military grade siege drill the Imperium has ever created. However, the siege drill can be exchanged for the immense Krius Grav Imploder, an utterly massive graviton weapon from the Dark Age of Technology, that even during the heresy at the height of the Mechanicum's power, they had no understanding at all of how it operated. Imagine pointing this thing at an enemy knight, and in mere moments that knight is reduced to the size of a large beach ball, using its own mass to crumple it like an empty tin can. Then there's the Warmaster Annihilator that has two primary weapons as well, but they're the same weapon on either arm a pair of Suzerain-class plasma destructors, which is basically a fancy way of saying a quadruple-barreled Titan plasma blast gun. 
but that'll turn just about anything into a pile of molten slag. So you've got a melee variant and a ranged variant, but both of them do have further arrays of weapons fitting the entire range of weapon armaments that a Warhound is capable of wielding on either shoulder, as well as an array of giant autocannons and mortars over the carapace which itself is protected by an obscene amount of void shields. So in the end, there's very little either Warmaster can't destroy, especially in regard to that of other titans. And at last, we have made it to the Emperor-class titans. Much like the Warmaster, there's two different versions of this titan, the Emperor Imperator and the Emperor Warmonger. You know that meme, everybody gangster till the church starts walking? Well, the Emperor classes are the reason why that's a thing. They are simply walking fortresses, and whilst we could foolishly attempt to shine a light on their armaments, we'd be here literally all day. I think it's best that we take a look at what differentiates the two instead. The Imperator is ultimately your classic walking death cathedral. Fire and brimstone, death and fury, find the enemy and delete the enemy. And whilst the Warmonger does the same, it does things with more long-range combat in mind. Where an Imperator will step on your house and your neighbor's house and your neighbor's neighbor's house with a single stomp, the Warmonger will detonate you from several kilometers away as you see its terrifying visage upon the horizon. And instead of spending ages fluffing over the different mechanisms of the two Emperor classes, I wanted to take some time to talk about two unique individual Imperators and Warmongers that I really liked. There was once a Warmonger of Legio Perennia called Abyssus Edax. Now, at the time of this tale, Abyssus Edax was aboard the Super Heavy Mechanicum Arc Freighter Omnisiax. And for those of you who are unaware, a Super Heavy Arc Freighter is one of the biggest vessels in the entirety of the Imperium. Not much save bigger Arc Freighters and that if the Imperial Fist's Phalanx can outscale these things. The Alpha Legion really wanted this Titan, and so what they did was infiltrate the ship, man the Titan with a heretical crew and princeps, and use the Titan whilst it was literally on board the ship to decimate the Mechanicum forces. I like this so much because this was the first time in the Imperium's history that a Titan would be activated aboard its transport vessel to do war with the occupants of that same vessel. And now for a unique Imperator, Abominatus, known as the Despoiler of Worlds. Not Abaddon, he's the other Despoiler of Worlds. Anyways, Abominatus was once an Imperator of unknown name from the Legio Magna, who turned traitor early on in the heresy. But what makes Abominatus so special isn't what it's done, but what it is. This giant walking death machine became possessed by a bloodthirster of corn, and swelled and mutated into a giant mass of violence and death. With demonic weapons never before seen on a titan, such as a blood cannon that shoots giant waves of warp-infused molten blood at its foes and an enormous scorpion cannon, only ever before seen on the considerably smaller brass scorpion demon engine, and the creme de la creme, known only as the Manglers, a series of chainsawed claws with each claw rumored to be the size of a Reaver Titan in and of itself. And the best thing about Abominatus is that no one knows where he is or what he's doing. And I am thoroughly thrilled at the prospect of Games Workshop bringing back this obscene creature one day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, before we draw this video to a close, we have one more Titan class left to mention, the one of a kind, Castigator class Titan. So I'm going to assume watching this that you don't know what the Castigator Titan is. And just for reference, all of this information comes from the Grey Knight Omnibus by Ben Counter. And that's important because all of the information I've chucked at you so far originates from a variety of Titanicus books and Horus Heresy novels, etc., where the main portion of data on Warhammer's God Engines can be found. And the great thing about the Titanicus books and the Horus Heresy novels is that they are filled with details. The Titanicus books sometimes feel like field manuals, and the Horus Heresy novels are set in a time before the Imperium lost its ability to effectively record keep. So all of this information on the Castigator is, to a degree, subjective. However, there are at least some facts we can glean, most notably the shape and size of the Titan. Now, whilst I'm not going to give you exact measurements because they don't exist, we do know that it is the biggest of all Titans, and stood without a hunched body like all of the aforementioned Titans. It had definable shoulders, neck, and head, and stood in a very much humanoid stance. Another really important thing about the Castigator is that it did not require any crew or princeps of any kind to pilot. It was operated by an AI, and in some ways the Castigator was a singular living being, capable of speed and agility unseen by any other knight or titan within the Imperium. The Grey Knights encountered this enormous creation on a forge world in M41 after the Titan and the entire forge world had spent an unknown stint in the warp. 
essentially leading to the Castigator being slightly less than alright on a mental level. It was, however, Compass Mentus enough to monologue to the Grey Knights, talking about how it was allegedly the father of all Titans being the progenitor and originator, with all other Titans being less than crude imitations of it, and potentially some other fuckery about how it allegedly met the real Omnissiah. Anyways, the Grey Knights pulled a demon out of the Titan, killed it, then killed the Titan. But the saddest thing of all was that the Grey Knights had the opportunity to retrieve the STC of the Castigator, but ultimately decided that no more of it should ever exist and fucking destroyed that too. It's a real shame because seeing a Castigator Titan throw down with the Bominatus would be some shit straight out of Gurren Lagann, and I'd honestly be totally down for that. You'll have noticed over the course of this video that outside of comparable sizes, I've not actually made reference to any factual sizes of the Titans, and that's because there's simply so many conflicting sources. Some sources that are quoted quite often say that the Warlord is like 33 meters tall, and some other sources put it at 200 meters tall, and there's even a couple that say it's over half a kilometer in height. It's truly a total shitshoot to try and apply height to these things. Especially if you decide to do a whole Titan versus insert thing from another universe debate, because you'll never come to any concrete conclusions. And personally, I don't know if the height stat matters all that much anyway. If you take a peek at any Horus Heresy novels and see how Titans in combat are described, the absolute horror they bring is beyond anything, and that power is what matters, not some arbitrary height stat. Anyways, thank you all for watching this video. It was an absolute pleasure to make. We have a Patreon link down below if you're enjoying our podcast videos or shorts, and want to help out or maybe steer the direction of what we make. We've got a Discord link down there too if you like the idea of talking to me or any other member of the Astartes Anonymous team. We're also still working on our homebrew review series both in long form and in short form. So if you like the idea of us making some content, showing off your homebrew, hop in the Discord and submit it to us. Anyways, finally, I wanted to give a shout out to our beloved patrons. Oxy Oxy, Ollie Wally, Nick Lass, Rion, Barbon, Black Hall, Bobby Coolpop, The Croc Enthusiast, Dark Cannibal, The Gaming Storyteller, Frank, Jury Rigged Hobbies, Jordan, Thane Horrigan, Johannes, Josh, and Voxcast to Nowhere. Thank you all very, very much. You guys are incredible. Take it easy, everyone. We'll see you next time.